gracious Heavenly Father, I stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity and the privilege that you've given us together to fellowship around your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches us, filtering out all the foolishness and the ignorance, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, direct our thoughts into the greatness and the wonders of your grace, that Jesus Christ might be exalted in whose name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In my last video, we were looking at, at how election is seen in the Old Testament as well as in the book of John, where it is then developed stronger here in Paul's epistles, particularly in, in the text that we're looking at here in Romans. We see that man is not saved by his own faith, nor, or that is redeemed by his own faith, nor by his own decision a view that is based on human merit in which we would give credit to those who have this ability as opposed to those who do not which is why we know that boasting is excluded Romans 327 we looked at that in, in chapter 3 we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves it, the faith, is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It has been my experience that modern Christianity appeals to men on this basis, and the Christian world as a whole celebrates it. But this is not the gospel of Christ. It is not the gospel as we have seen it presented. Because it, it, it assumes a capability in fallen man that he simply doesn't have. And we saw that in the first few chapters of Romans. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Romans chapter 9, we're not there yet, but the question automatically comes up, yeah, but... Now, in our last study together, we were in Romans chapter 8, and I believe that we left off somewhere around the area of verse 30, I believe, 30, 31. There, there isn't a single Christian who isn't aware of the conflict that we have recently looked at between flesh and spirit. And we suddenly find out that there is still sin present only to discover that the victory over sin is, it's not our victory but Christ's that your conflict with sin is not your battle that battle has been won and we can rest in the grace and the provision of our God now we see that God foreknew us because he loved us. He predestinated us according to his purpose. He called us according to his grace and he justified us by his obedience and he glorified us by making us join heirs with Christ. And folks, it doesn't take a whole lot of study to realize that there was no synergism in that process. It was God who intimately knew us before. It was God who preordained us according to the good pleasure of His will, and it was God who called us by His grace, which I believe he does through our hearing the gospel. The text says we've been called and it was God who made us righteous by the obedience of Christ. We weren't made righteous according to our own standard or performance. 
and it was God who made us join heirs with Christ, and it was all by grace, all of it. Multitudes of people have read verses like Romans 5, 19, for by one man's disobedience, the elect were made sinners, the many were made sinners, the elect were made sinners. There was no synergism in that. You did not choose to be a sinner in Adam, and in the same way, you did not choose to become righteous by the obedience of Christ. It was not a decision of your own. Folks, he made you righteous. This is the operation of the grace of God. This, this grew out of the fact that we know all things are working together for our good. It says we know that, and it is a perfect tense, it's, and it's oida. We know it by revelation. You don't know it because you've experienced it. You don't know it because you dreamed it. You don't know it because you have reached that conclusion on your own. You know it because God revealed it in his word. And the reason many don't know it is because they don't know his word. It's just that simple. That's how we know it. It is impossible to say that it, it's not working together for our good because of something that happened in your life. You know that it does because God said so. I think I mentioned this before. Someone told me that if we could just find a piece of Noah's Ark, we'd, we could know that it existed. If it proved authentic, it would be the greatest testimony that the world's ever seen to the existence of of the ark to the authenticity of, of scripture and on and on that went greatest testimony that man has ever known you've got to be kidding what are you holding in your hand folks the greatest testimony of the ark is that God said it God said it existed in this book who cares about a rotten piece of wood? And so we know that all things work together for our good. All things. Because God Almighty said so. Now, folks, they either do or he's a liar. Your choice. We then are told who in the world could be against us if God is for us? Stop and think about the power of that verse. The if there is a first class condition. Since God is in our place, man, what could stand against it? I mean, is there anything greater than God? The word for there in the text is hooper or hooper, which means in our place. God is in our place. You don't have a higher representative. Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Now, I don't know how we can even fully cover that portion of a sentence to me, that one verse, verse 31, contains all of the grandeur of grace. I want you to take a look. Uh, I'll try to put this up on the screen. These five precious words refer to redemption, not salvation or, or deliverance in the, in the ongoing sense, in the post-redemptive -redempt term. Many want to lump all five of these words into the one word, salvation. And I don't believe that we should do that. I don't believe that we can do that. Words are given us for a purpose. Each one has a meaning. There was no synergism, take note of the fact, no synergism at all in each of these five aspects of God's redemptive work. None. Verse 32, he spared not his own son. 
And I think the human mind would think, you know, man, it, it, it would just be wonderful if he, you know, if he gave us a million bucks, you know, if he gave us a big, a big horse ranch, you know, with lots of pretty horses, you know, maybe throw in a few thousand head of cattle, you know, or some nice cabin down by the lake someplace. You know, with a boat dock, you know, to accommodate a high performance speedboat. I mean, you know, look, we can, you know, we can, we can take that to, you know, anywhere we want to. And people's minds ramble on about such things, which are nothing, nothing. What counts is eternity. What counts is our relationship, our ongoing fellowship and relationship with God on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. What greater thing could God have done than give his own son in our place is what I believe the, that's the thought the Holy Spirit is intended to convey here. Once again, the word is huper. We read in the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Never. Never does the word who pair occur in that context. Jesus Christ died for all men in the sense that they were delivered from the condemnation that was theirs in Adam. The text says, in Christ all shall be made alive. So that now they stand before God based upon their own sin or in their own sin, not Adam's. But he died in our place. In no place in the Word of God is Christ called the Redeemer of all men. If, if Jesus Christ died in your place, how could you die? What kind of God do many Christians worship? You know, who will say in one breath, Jesus Christ died in your place, and if you're not careful, you're also going to go to hell. What kind of God is that? And more importantly, what does that do to the price that Christ paid? Is it of, of such little value that you could annul it? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. It wasn't the, the high priest, the temple police, the mob, or the Roman soldiers, or, or anyone else who delivered Christ. But God, we, we see from the text, it was God. This same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, said to Pilate, if, you, if most of you are familiar here, with, you would have no power at all except it had been given thee from above. What power was given to Pilate from above to, get, to condemn Christ? God ordained Pilate to commit Christ to crucifixion. He that spared not his own son, God incarnate, died in your place. And God incarnate rose from the dead. If he died in my place, I cannot die. All of God's plan of redemption is laid out for us here. This is not the plan of of salvation. It's a plan of redemption. You are saved by faith, but you are redeemed by the finished work of Jesus Christ under the grace of God. He spared not his own son, but he is the one who delivered him up in the place of all of us. How many, how many is that? Some, all? Is Paul more important than you? 
are we to say that Christ died in, in so many people's place that, you know, plus or minus one or two isn't going to make any difference? You know, in the end, it ultimately, you know, man is the, the deciding factor here. Folks, you are as precious to God as any other person in whose place Christ died. And then one has to stop and think. If Jesus Christ died in your place, what value does that place on you in the eyes of God? Why do I sense so many Christians, you know, that apparently God is, he's far away, he's, he's, he's a little concerned about what's really going on in my life. We know that God is conforming you to the image of his son, whether you feel like he is or not. Your suffering may be painful for the moment, but it's according to his good pleasure and according to his good purpose. And God, folks, is not your enemy. God has nothing against you. He isn't bringing suffering into your life because it, it pleases him to torment you. God considers you as precious as his son. And he, he's made you a joint heir with Christ. And there's a lot of the, you know, the vestiges of the flesh that need to be whittled away. But you need to realize, you, you need to grasp, you need to rejoice in the fact that he delivered up his own beloved son, his own dear son, in your place. And it was for all. Not one is left out. It is astounding how many people today resent any comment that, that all of God's people will be in heaven. The great objection, you know, to such a comment is that it squelches missionary effort. And I can't believe that. Anybody that tells me that tells me that the reason that the missionary goes out is because, well, people are going to go to hell if he doesn't. And, and if that's what he thinks, he ought to stay home. The reason a missionary goes to the mission field is because he loves Christ and he wants to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to God's elect. The gospel is a call to God's sheep who have gone astray, that they might return unto the shepherd and bishop of their souls. People's thinking is not very consistent many times biblically. What is an elect person? Oh, well, that's one that's accepted Christ. What is a saved person? Oh, that's, that's one who has accepted Christ. My Bible says, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus our Lord with eternal glory. Looks like they got to be elect before they can even obtain it. You know, and you just told me a saved person is an elect person. Folks, we ought to be consistent when we approach this book. You and I were made righteous because Jesus Christ died in our place. He that, that spared not his own son. It's God incarnate who died in your place. When he died on the cross, your name was there. It, 
in the sixth chapter, we found that we were crucified with him. We were buried with him. We rose with him. And it's a finished transaction. And again, we had nothing to do with that. No synergism involved in that. And you say, well, Steve, I don't deserve it. Well, of course you don't. Of course you don't. If you deserved it, there'd be two gods. I've received emails. You know, I just can't figure out why God loves me. I, folks, I think that is a carnal thing to say. And, and I've been criticized by people for saying that. I, I still think that's carnal. What that says is, that says that there ought to be a reason God loves me. And the only reason is Christ, not by anything I do, not by anything I've done. God would have loved me a little bit more if I had prayed a little bit more, studied a little bit more, worked harder, you know, for him, went to the mission field, did this, did that. God would have loved me a little bit more. Anything to make God love me more. When his love is not based on my performance, my production, it is, it is based on Jesus Christ having died in our place, that we are his child. His own dear son died in my place. Wrap your mind around the, fact, the, the price God paid for you. He knows the way I take. And he says that when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Sometimes in the testing, the gold doesn't look that good. But I have the word of God to say that when he is finished testing me, I shall come forth as gold. How are you going to let that impact your life? I need that patient endurance in circumstances that I can't control because I know my God. I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He delivered up his own son for us all. How shall he not then give us freely give us all things the word freely there is our word caris grace i i believe this is all this all things is tied to our being co-heirs with christ verse 28 all things work together for good to them that love god to those who are that called according to his purpose If he delivered, there's no if, since he delivered his own son in my place, how could it not be that all things work together for my good? How shall he not, without a charge, without a restriction, without a condition, freely give me all things? Folks, if there were conditions, it wouldn't, you wouldn't see the word freely in the text. It would not say the word freely. How shall he not freely give us all things? Because he's already given us the greatest. What in my life, what circumstance, what experience could compare with God delivering up his, his own son in my place. If he's already given his son in your place, should you have any problem at all with the fact that all things work together for your good? Did he freely give you all things? 
Now, I'm more than willing to admit that some of the things that he gives are not so pleasant. But I refuse to be moved away from the absolute conviction that they're for my good. And I'm talking about everything. The God, folks, that I worship, the God that I know, is not a God of torture, but a God of love. And I know because he has told me that he only touches me in love and that he's working all things together because he has determined that I be conformed to the image of his son. He, there's purpose. He has a purpose here in all of this. And I am, I am frantically grasping that which is of no value, that which will soon pass away. And, and spending so little time on that which is eternal. I'll be honest with you, I spend an enormous amount of time in this book, but I don't, I don't feel like I spend any time at all. He's in the God of, of all grace and love is working patiently in me and in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But we need to know this. And, and if, if all of this can be true, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who? Somebody needs to preach a whole sermon on God's elect. It is impossible in my opinion, to be a Christian and not at least realize that the word election is in the text. That it's in the word of God. And since the word election seems to rob man of his freedom, his, his autonomy, what he can choose and what, what, and what he can do and not do, it becomes an angry word in the lives and the minds of many Christians. They hate that word. And, and they work that out in their minds. They, they justify, they justify that desire for autonomy. So, so that you are elect if you accept Christ. If you accept Jesus Christ, then you're one of God's elect. They reverse it. It's an open-ended election program, and it'll finally turn out who's elected and who isn't, depending upon the choice of man, not God's choice, not realizing that with, with such human logic and reasoning as that, folks, there would be no need for the word elect in the text to begin with. It's God's elect. We are elect. We are chosen by God. He chose us. We didn't choose him. Yet we know from the 29th verse that that was a long time ago. It was ahead of time. It isn't that he knew what you would do ahead of time. He didn't look down in the, in the, in the future and see. He doesn't gain in knowledge. It was that he knew you as a man knows his wife. You are his son. You are always his son. And 99.9%, .9 now maybe I shouldn't say that, 99%, 98% of Christendom has him going to hell. Somebody wrote to me just recently con concerned, expressing concern over personal sin, asking me about the prodigal son. He's a son. He was a son when he, when he was home. He was a son when he left. He was a son in the far country. He was a son when he messed up, and he was a son when he came home. He was always a son. And what did Christ do? What did Christ do? Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost. His, what belonged to him. Lost sons. He did that. It's finished. These are God's elect. God did the pre, 
determining, and God did the election. And who shall lay any charge against a single one of them? Now this is in the text. This is just a charge to bring a charge, to accuse, not to condemn. It's God that made them righteous, so God is declaring the righteousness anytime there's a charge brought. It isn't that it isn't that no charges are brought. Satan is accusing the brethren day and night. Well, surely you can bring charges against me and, and against other Christians, but it is God who declares them righteous. Now, personally, I don't want to get into that verbal conflict with God. Well, Lord, you may have declared so and so righteous, you know, but but he isn't very good. He didn't appear that to be very righteous. I wouldn't want to do that. If God Almighty has made me righteous, what accusation could be brought? It's God that made righteous, that made you righteous. If you don't think that that righteousness is right, well, that, folks, your dispute is with God, not with me. Yeah, in some cases, apparently, God didn't do a very good job. I, I vehemently disagree. I know that's what modern Christianity for the most part believes. I do not believe that. That's one of the problems I see in modern Christianity. We split Christians up into good Christians and moderate Christians and not so good Christians. And then there's a there's a whole herd, you know, of poor Christians. And God's elect. Absolutely righteous. And there's not, there's not, you know, like when you drive, you know, go to the, out to eat, you know, and you order from the menu. It's not small, medium, large, and extra large. Folks, they are all as righteous as Christ. Are you being told this? Because it's, 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 it's these aren't my words. And the ones that you perceive to be not so righteous, really, folks, are the very ones who need to know that they are as righteous as every child of God in Christ. And yet these seem to be the ones that are, you know, that are picked on the most by the self-righteous bullies who are, who are no more righteous than the ones that, they're, that they charge with not being righteous. I'll admit, in some, the old man is more important than it, uh, or the old man is more apparent than in others. Sometimes in the ones in which it's not very apparent, it's more prevalent than you might know. It's always there. There's no one. No one. There's not a one of you, that, not a one of us, who isn't constantly in conflict with the presence of sin. But the victory, folks, is through Christ, not ourselves. Not ourselves, not in our own strength. God has made us righteous. And now we have, who is he that condemns? Now this, this is more serious. This is, this is actually a condemnation. It is Christ Jesus that died. Christ Jesus. Who is, who is the one who would condemn? It is Christ Jesus that died. What is that verse saying? What's that verse saying? I, I, all I can do is tell you what I, I think it's saying. That the one who was condemned for your sin is not condemning. Folks, we plumb the depths of, of the eternal plan of God that should bring us to our knees before God. 
that just that one truth alone, that, that he was made sin for us, he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What happened? What happened to the one who was made sin for us? If you condemn me, Christ was condemned for the very charge you're bringing against me. Sins I haven't even committed yet were laid on Christ. It is Christ that died. But it doesn't stop there. We have to do something with that sin. Christ was heard. He was heard with great crying and tears and in Timothy. He was justified in the spirit. God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied not the travail of yours or mine, but Christ's. God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Therefore, he rose again. His resurrection is the absolute certain proof that the price that he paid was sufficient. It is the absolute conviction that every one, every one of my sins, past, present, and future, were taken care of in Christ, so that I stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. I stand before him holy, without blemish, without spot, made the righteousness of God in him who, had, who is well, we, we see that he's at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Many of you, especially some of you watchmen out there, you're familiar with the, with the temple where the priest ministered daily in, in, in the furniture in the temple. You know, you're familiar with the furniture and what it speaks of. And, but folks, never once in 30 years have I heard one of those programs where, where they point out that there wasn't a chair because the priest activity is never finished. He can't sit down. He's never done. Those sacrifices ministered daily never removed the conscience, the conscience of sin. But this man, this man offered one sacrifice for sin and sat down at the right hand of God. Everything, everything that's necessary for your righteousness is already done. There should be in you no conscious guilt of sin. It's Christ who makes intercession for us. He's the mediator. The horror of Romanism that suggests that Mary, you know, is a, is a co-mediatrix. You know, it so shocked the minds of those who were, who were interested in this book years ago that we had the Protestant Reformation. the last few verses of this wonderful chapter that we've been looking at has been described by the translators. You'll see it written in the authorized version as this last section is subtitled More Than Conquerors. So that's where we'll pick up in, in our next video. I read that, I read that, and you know, just so uh, just allow me to point out the obvious unfortunate fact that that we don't hear much about that today, despite that heading given above the text in the, the KJV, which so many seem to cherish 
over all the rest of the, of the translations, above all other translations, the King James, one can't help but wonder what those who believe that we can mess up and go to hell do with those words there, more than conquerors. Well, until next time, I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for your prayers, your continued prayers, your messages, your comments. I try to respond to as many as I can. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. And thank you for watching.